Welcome, my name is Dr. Elaine Rosen and I'm here from the Division of Adolescent Medicine. I'm the Medical Director for the Eating Disorder Program and I'm here to talk to you today about the difference between disordered eating and an eating disorder. This will be the first of a three-part series. Today we're going to focus more on defining what the problem is and in the next two sessions we'll talk about treatment and then prevention. I'll be uh, hopefully joined by my teammates on those sessions. That'll be Dr. Kelly Ruglis from psychology and Janelle Smith, registered dietitian. So we'll try to give you a full picture of what we're about and what kind of issues we're addressing. So I have a question for the viewers. How many of you out there have ever experienced any dissatisfaction with your weight or your body? Anybody? Oh, everybody. I got it. Okay. How many of you have ever experienced ah, guilt <laughs> over eating something that you feel maybe you shouldn't have eaten? And how many of you have sworn you're going to do it this time? You're going to start on a new program, a new plan. You've got it. You're going to do it this time only to feel dejected and frustrated and like a failure if it doesn't work out for you. Do not worry, you're not alone. So I have a question to pose. Can an overweight or obese person even be healthy? Can a thin or very slim uh, person without any actual disease be unhealthy? What is healthy? It's hard to know. And maybe we should turn to our society to see if there's any answers there. Dr. Kelly Brownell from Yale University. Mm, I guess there's no answers from Dr. Brownell. Um, well, you know what? I guess you don't really need to hear from a leading researcher to know that there's a lot of mixed messages going on in our society. Um, you know, uh, supersize it, but wear a size zero. And really, you don't need to do anything other than go to your market and stand in the checkout line. All right. So Dr. Diane Newmark Stainer is a researcher from the University of Minnesota who's made her life's work uh, describing eater, eating patterns and um, weight control behaviors in, um, in adolescents and young adults. And in her book, I'm Like a So Fat, which is an awesome book, uh, she describes the spectrum of eating activity and weight related concerns. Um, from healthy to problematic. So behaviors, body image, eating behaviors, and weight status. So you can see it really is a continuum and where it becomes actually, you know, the division between eating disorder and disordered eating, it's very, very hard to say. But for our purposes, how many people are we talking about? How many adolescents fall in this extreme end? So she's done many projects that have benefited our understanding of these trends. Um, this probably, this study here that was published in 2011 has really the best treasure trove of information. Um, they started in the late 90s. They took uh, initially 4,000 plus middle school and high school students uh, from St. Paul, Minnesota area and they followed them over 10 years. So it was divided into two groups. And we're gonna to go to the dieting uh, slide that gives you an example about that. Um, so the first group was started at age 11, 12 and wrapped up 10 years later. The second group started at age 15, 16 and, and followed up 10 years after that. So um, really got a nice look at what happens over time. So dieting. Dieting is a very strong risk factor for both eating disorders and obesity. So, you know, what other $5 billion industry can claim a 95% failure rate and still keep on thriving? Um, and why do they survive? Because they're able to blame the failure of the diet on you, the weak-willed customer. So you are not the problem, dieting is the problem. And we can see here, we have our younger girls who were 12 and 13 here, and dieting levels stayed pretty steady over um, 10 years. Same thing for our mid-teens. Only in boys did it show the, the mid-adolescent boys had an uptick over 10 years, possibly when their metabolism started to slow down just a little bit. 
So here we look at unhealthy. We're getting a little bit more towards the problem end of the spectrum that I showed you before. So we're going into now unhealthy weight control behaviors from adolescence to young adulthood. Um, un unhealthy weight control behaviors include fasting, skipping meals, eating very little food, um, using a, a food substitute, a shake or a powder. Um, so, you know, stuff that, you know, not that uncommon to, to actually experience or know someone who has experience. Pretty high. You can see here we're starting with the younger kids at 48.2%, and if you go three years later, they're at 60%. So a lot of, lot of uh, stuff going on there in um, early to middle adolescence to just be aware of. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to ne neglect the boys out here. Okay, here we have extreme weight control behaviors. That would include purging. Uh, that would include laxatives, diuretics, um, really the extremes. You can be extreme and be in the unhealthy category because obviously if you fast too much, or skip too many meals, that's extreme. But these are sort of, you know, the more concrete markers of uh, extreme ends. Um, and mind you, this is um, all for the purpose of losing weight. So again, this is quite interesting in what an increase there is over the 10-year period. But just look at these numbers in general. One in 10, you know, one in five. These are very, very common, but not all of these people are diagnosed with eating disorders and not all of them really have eating disorders. Um, binge eating, I wanna take a minute to define what binge eating is. Uh, because binge eating disorder, as you'll see later, has just been defined as an official diagnosis um, over the last couple of years. And it's defined really based on subjective criteria. So if you would eat so much in a short period of time that you would be embarrassed about what other people saw you, saw you eat, that would be one criteria. If you felt a sense of loss of control when you were um, having this binge, then that's a second criteria. So it really relies on very subjective, subjective criteria. Okay, self-induced vomiting. This to me is very interesting just to see how high the percentage is. Um, I think the estimates that we have for, st the statistics that we have for prevalence of eating disorders, which we'll see later, probably likely very, very underestimates uh, what these numbers actually are as this supports. And then laxative use, pretty dramatic rise here. Uh, interestingly, just among women and not so much men, um, but you know, all the way up to 4.8% in uh, middle young adulthood. So pretty, pretty interesting statistics overall. And you know, of course, this is confined to one test site. It was uh, 2,500, I believe, something around there that actually completed the 10-year follow-up. So they just took out those 2,500 and compared their beginning to their 10-year later points. So really nice numbers in that data. So not everybody, of course, who uses unhealthy weight control measures goes on to develop a full-blown eating disorder, and who does and doesn't probably has a lot to do with genetics and with um, what some of your personality traits are and, and, and characteristics. So now we move on to the formal diagnoses of eating disorders. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, or DSM as it's commonly known, is now in its fifth edition and has uh, really changed the landscape of how we define eating disorders. We now have a category that includes both feeding and eating disorders. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these because that's way beyond the scope of today's presentation. But I do want to point out a few things. So first of all, um, as with most things that are described in DSM, uh, it's characterized by persistent disturbance uh, of eating or eating-related behavior that results in poor intake and it impairs your health and your psychosocial functioning. So that's, that's going to be across the board. Um, what is new in here is that I want you to know about is this diagnosis of ARFID, which is a terrible acronym that stands for uh, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. 
And I mention that because it's, it's very, very new on the horizon in terms of being recognized. So we do not have a lot of uh, data on it, but it describes those really, really picky eaters that will only eat uh, white foods or dino nuggets or mac and cheese. And what distinguishes it as a, as a disorder is the fact that no matter what you do, they will not try anything else. And it can lead to all sorts of problems, including a weight loss that um, manifests like anorexia. But we're just really starting to work out all of this. Um, but for all of you who have picky eaters out there, maybe there will be some answers for you, or maybe, maybe, hopefully there will be. So um, anorexia, we've divided into two types, restricting and binge purge. Bulimia, we know, and binge eating disorder I mentioned before. <clears throat> so just how common is this? So here we have our lifetime prevalence. So lifetime prevalence is defined as if you were to sit down with your subject, um, have you at any point in your life experienced X, Y, and Z that would then meet the criteria for these diagnoses? So um, looking at 10,000 pretty robust, robust sample adolescents age 13 to 18, we see lifetime prevalence estimates of 0.3%. Remember, this is still a pretty young group that we're talking about here. Bulimia, 0.9%. Uh, binge eating disorder, 1.6%. And then these um, subacute, but nevertheless impactful, uh, other diagnoses, an additional 3.3%. <coughs> so pretty, pretty high prevalence even at that early age when they were collecting this information. A Dutch cohort um, looked at uh, 2,230 young people, mean age 11 in 2001, followed them every two to three years up through 2010, down to almost 1,600 people. A lifetime diagnosis of any eating disorder was established in 5.7% of female um, and 1.2% of the male adolescents. So again, more evidence that it's out there. What I find so interesting about working with eating and feeding disorders is that the medical and the psychiatric um, elements to these illnesses are inextricably linked. You can't have, um, you can't, there's no, me there's no mental health aspect of it that does not impact the body and vice versa. And finding the collaborative, um, team and researchers to address both of these sites equally is one of the challenges in terms of program development as well as, as well as research. Okay, nine truths about eating disorders. This was from a talk given by Dr. Cynthia Bulick, who is a very, very internationally renowned researcher based at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Truth number one. Many people with eating disorders look healthy, yet may be extremely ill. You cannot, you cannot judge based on appearance. Somebody who's overweight uh, initially can lose 20 pounds, look just fine by societal stand, standards, and still have a full-blown case of anorexia nervosa. Families are not to blame and can be the patient's and provider's best allies in treatment. As a physician, one of the things that is very uh, challenging to deal with is a lot of denial amongst parents. Oh no, my, can't, my kid can't have it. Oh no, that, you know, they're just being healthy. Um, so ridding the idea of shame and the stigma associated with having a disorder such as this is really, really important because the earlier we intervene with these kids and young adults and older adults for that matter, the quicker the resolution will be. An eating disorder diagnosis is a health crisis that disrupts personal and family functioning. They're not choices. I've heard this over and over again. My child made a bad choice and now understands why this was a bad choice. It's not a choice. Um, they are seriously biologically influenced illnesses. You do not necessarily have to have a family history of eating disorders. Uh, there are other genetic um, traits and tendencies, OCD, um, ADD, mood disorders, all sorts of things can provide the, um, the risk factors for the eating disorder in the family. 
Um, everyone's affected. I think that statement says it all. Uh, very much increased risk for both suicide and medical complications. Genes and environment play important roles. Uh, one of the best catchphrases that I've ever heard for this is genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Um, a stressor of any kind can bring it out. The stress of puberty, the stress of um, family discord, the stress of bullying, the stress of an illness, the stress of an illness in a, in a family member, the stress of you name it can take a genetically susceptible individual and bring the disease up. And it's as if a switch is flipped and all these changes ensue. Okay, uh, genes alone do not predict who will develop eating disorders. Full recovery is possible. Very, very important to know. Oftentimes we see extremes uh, through the media. Um, everybody beyond a certain age will remember Karen Carpenter, who was um, almost unfortunately the poster child for an eating disorder in the 70s. Um, that's a very, very extreme end. If we intervene at that unhealthy, unhealthy eating point in the continuum, that never has to happen. If you can get in there before three years of a diagnosis, you have a higher chance of having it go away and never come back again. Okay, so uh, we've touched on some of this already, but I wanted to go what in, into what are the risk factors for, for eating disorders. And again, I'm talking about all eating disorders and I'm including feeding disorders in there too. Um, in general, so trying not to focus just on anorexia or bulimia. Um, so, however, speaking of anorexia, uh, some traits tend to be perfectionism, um, more prone to anxiety, um, and then moving into the, some of the other eating disorders, depression, difficulties regulating emotion, some obsessive compulsive behaviors, and, and a rigid thinking style. Um, we talked about our society and how awful that is um, to our whole global mindset. Um, and then the biologic risk factors, a close family member with an eating disorder. Oftentimes um, the eating disorder may not have ever been disclosed or identified. So again, you know, we have to take no family history of anything with a grain of salt. Um, and then you can read the rest there for yourself. So type 1 diabetes, uh, because of the effect of both chronic illness and the control that um, adolescents and adults have with their insulin, it's more a setup for um, abuse of the insulin. Okay, so what are some of the symptoms of an eating disorder? So emo from the emotional and behavioral perspective, there's an intense and irrational fear of gaining weight, uh, negative or distorted body image, uh, avoiding eating with others, hoarding and hiding food, desire to cut out food groups, especially in a child uh, prior to the onset of puberty. If you start to see a child who becomes a vegetarian or a vegan, um, and that child, you know, is prone to a little bit of emotional ups and downs and or anxiety, OCD type, the symptoms. Keep, please keep that in the back of your head that um, to have a high index of suspicion for a developing eating disorder. Disappearing after eating, often to the bathroom, often for long periods of time. Obsessive interest in cooking shows, blah, blah, blah. Wearing baggy clothes. A uh, lifetime history of extreme pickiness, irritability, and mood swings. Well, that's pretty not uh, specific, but you get the idea. Elaborate food rituals, cutting up into small pieces, having it arranged in a certain way, having to eat foods in certain orders. Little concern over extreme weight loss. Uh, later, a withdrawal from social activities. Exercising frenetically for the purpose of burning calories. Um, a possible direct observed association between emotions and eating. And pro uh there are websites out there that cater to girls who want to be anorexic and provide them support for their drive for thinness. So parents, please be on the lookout on your children's computers for evidence of uh, these sites. Okay, some physical signs. Obviously, this is only a partial list. Dramatic weight loss or lack of weight gain in a growing child 
change in bowel habits or frequent ab vague abdominal pain. Sometimes uh, these situations present to the pediatrician with very nonspecific symptoms, dizziness, headaches, um, abdominal pain, workup doesn't show anything, but we want to make sure that that pediatrician looks at the growth chart because uh, that could be your answer right there. Not always, but it could be. Um, if other people express concerns, you're with your child every day, you don't see those incremental changes, but other people might. Uh, dizziness, chest pain, feeling cold more often, and menstrual irregularities, also frequent illnesses. Okay, so what do I do? I am a parent, I have these concerns, and what do I do? So if your instincts as a parent or a friend or loved one, um, if your instincts tell you that there's something off, pay attention to your instincts. They're most always going to be or very often going to be right. It doesn't mean you need to bring in the guards at that time. It just means that you need to kind of track it, watch it, and don't discount it. Um, if you it's, not, it's very common that one um, spouse may feel that there's a problem and another doesn't. If you're the one who feels that there's a problem, persist because your instincts, again, are probably right. At, at the point that it feels right, sit down, have a talk with your loved one, express your concerns. You can do some just active listening and don't expect him or her to agree with you. Uh, there may also be an overly dramatic reaction. Uh, how dare you? Me thinks the lady doth protest too much. Um, what are you talking about? Tears, which is probably a sign that you're right on. Information. Uh, I just put this group up here because this is one of the best sources of information. Uh, and guidance. They have 24-hour helplines, they have uh, printed materials, and a list of referral resources. So um, please check out NEDA and make an appointment. So your primary care doctor, um, you can, I would, if you're going to see a dietitian or a therapist and you're concerned that your child might have, or I keep saying your child, but your loved one may have an eating disorder, uh, please make sure that they have that in their repertoire of treatment and not just from a list on their website, from actually talking to them on the phone and making sure that that's something they do regularly. Okay. So back to our original question, disordered eating or eating disorder. The distinction matters less if it's caught early. Um, don't wait. Get help before it becomes harder to treat and know that you can, you can make a difference. And we are here to help. Knowledge is power. So do we have some questions from uh, the group out there? Okay. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about ARFID? So yes, as I was saying, those are the kids who from the moment they come out, um, or sometimes just a little bit later, are very resistant to foods. Most kids will go through a course where they don't like vegetables around three to four, but usually they grow out of it. These kids start young, they start cutting out foods, and survive on such unbelievable processed food all through their lives. Um, it's remarkable that they grow and they have normal blood values. With ARFID, you can be overweight, you can be average weight or underweight, um, and you may never come to medical attention unless, like I said, you know, you're, well, obviously, if your parent is very concerned about you, but when it starts to interfere with your family function, with your own growth and development as you head into adolescence, then it be can really become problematic. and. As I said before, you're at risk for jumping into what we call a secondary form of anorexia where you start to lose weight. So even though you don't have body image issues the same as typical anorexia, it can manifest the same way. So look at the backstory to understand that. Um, and do you have to be overweight to have binge eating disorder? Definitely not. Uh, about 20% of overweight and obese people have binge eating disorder by many studies, but somebody can be average weight and 
have binge eating disorder, so that does not exclude that diagnosis. The key to that is the feelings of guilt and loss of control that surround it. So, thank you. Okay, well, I thank you very much for joining me. Honored to have you and look forward to seeing everybody next time where we'll join up with my colleagues, Dr. Ruglis and Janelle Smith, and we'll talk about treatment. Until then, be well and thank you.